I'm going to introduce uh, uh, Dr. Lu uh, Olivia Lunenberg, Caroline, Dr. Nora, sorry, Dr. Caroline Nori, apologies for that, Dr. Andrew Somalat, Hannah Chapman, Lena Sakure, Sana Daniel, Saif Saeed Saeed, Claire Yu. Please welcome our team of researchers. Thank you. Hi everyone, thanks for sticking around. Um, my name is Olivia Lannenberg and I have been chairing the network of care home researchers the past two years. Um, so during this next half hour, we're going to just give you a little flavor of the kind of research that we've been doing. Um, and then obviously afterwards we'll have some time for uh, questions, but let me first just introduce the network itself. So uh, I think we were, f were founded in 2018, which seems yesterday and quite a long time ago at the same time. Um, and it's really uh, to support research in, in care homes uh, due to limited, um, uh, yeah, limited research within the area. But then we really focus particularly on Nightingale Hammerson. So we really want to support researchers that are working in Nightingale Hammerson, but of course also people living in Nightingale Hammerson and working in Nightingale Hammerson. So um, that's kind of unique about the approach that we put the care home at the center and pre-pandemic, we would actually meet in the care home. Of course, during the pandemic, we met online instead, but hopefully we can go back to these uh, real life meetings soon. So we're really here to support and collaborate with both current and former researchers working in Nightingale Hammerson. Um, and it's of course, like I said, to support Nightingale Hammerson themselves uh, through research to improve quality assurance and standards for its residents and staff. And then also to develop research capabilities and resources, resources within the care homes um, as the host organization. And where uh, uh, members uh, include PhD students, uh, we're research associates, research fellows, and we're part of many different universities, most based in uh, in London um, and so I just want to introduce this army of care home researchers here now um, uh, and they're all going to introduce a bit of their uh, work that they're either are currently doing or have been doing in Nightingale Hammerson House. Thank you Olivia. Hello everyone, uh, I'm Sana and with me is my colleague Saf. We are from UCL Department of Dental Public Health and together we'll be presenting our research study called Topic. Topic stands for Improving the Oral Health of Older People in Care Homes. It's a feasibility study funded by NHR, NIHR. Um, so just to give you a bit of background and rationale behind our work. Um, so we know this from research that the oral health of older people in care homes is much worse as compared to the older people living in communities. And that poor oral health has a profound effect on the quality of life. It does not only affect your ability to eat, but also your ability to, to speak, to smile, your willingness to communicate with other people, and even, even your self-esteem. Hence why it's really important to prevent any oral diseases. And in order to achieve this, NICE has published a set of guidelines called NG48. These guidelines are specifically for care homes and for everyone care, working in care homes, basically from management to the staff. And the aim of this, these guidelines are to ensure that the residents receive daily mouth care and that the staff should have the necessary knowledge and skills needed to deliver daily oral care and that there should be regular oral health assessments in place. So in this project, what we are doing is we are trying to understand how realistic these guidelines are when it comes to implementation. So we have designed an oral health intervention using those guidelines and with the help of a co-design process. So in the co-design phase, we have worked in different care homes with care home staff to understand their experiences and the challenges they face when it comes to delivering oral care to the residents. So using our learnings from the co-design process and also the evidence base from NICE, we have designed an oral health intervention, which we are testing in this feasibility study. And the details of the intervention will be described by my colleague. Over to you, Saf. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Saf. Thank you, Sana. So I'll just quickly take you through this uh, trial that we are doing in, in, in uh, the care homes. So, so far, we have recruited 22 care homes, of which 11 are in London and 11 in Northern Ireland. And so 
if these care homes are randomly allocated to different care uh, different intervention groups sorry different groups one is the intervention group and the other is the control group and the intervention group as uh, the name suggests receives the intervention so like every other study there is eligibility criteria based on which we have screened the residents and uh, recruited the participants so as, as Sana mentioned, we have co-designed sort of this intervention based on the NICE guidelines with the help of the care home staff, so, so as to make it more practically feasible. And what includes in this oral health intervention is that first is the care home staff training that is provided by us to equip them with skills and knowledge to promote oral health. And the second part is the their home worker assisted tooth brushing with the help of fluoridated toothpaste. And the third part is basically oral health assessment. So these are one of the uh, intervention materials that we co-design. So these are certain duties that the care home staff helps us uh, during this uh, course of study. And as for the control group, they just do the usual care. So slightly less duties for them. And so every six months we are going to the care home and collecting data and there are also some data which we collect on a monthly basis. And so just cautious of the time, I'll, I'll just be very brief. Uh, so this study is funded by NIHR and the chief investigator is Professor George Sakos. And me and Sana are part of the local study team and we have been helped by other colleagues as well. So we'll be taking questions in the end. So thank you so much. Everyone. Um, it's a real great pleasure to be talking to you today. Uh, we, so my name is Lena Shakur and this is my colleague Claire Yu and we will be talking about a study that we didn't necessarily do in a care home but it has direct relevance we think to caregivers and decision makers in care homes who are thinking about how to allocate resources and what's best for the residents. So the question we asked ourselves when we did the study was, what can robots do to help people with dementia? What is the evidence to date? And um, here you can see the study has been published and we conducted it uh, as a team with um, Andrew, who's going to be talking later in Jill Livingston. And um, we aimed to identify robot use in dementia care to examine the feasibility and acceptability of robot use in dementia care and to assess effectiveness of robots on cognition, neuropsychiatric symptoms and quality of life, something that's been mentioned quite a bit today. So I'm going to pass over to Claire, the lead author on this study and our new member in the network of care home researchers to tell you more about the results. Thank you, Lena. So to achieve the study aim, we have conducted a systematic review and a meta-analysis. So uh, what is a systematic review? So it is a type of study which collects and appraise and summarize all the published evidence on a topic. And we also conduct a meta-analysis on this topic. So uh, so this is basically the use of statistical method to combine information to understand our overall results of effectiveness. So uh, overall, our results have identified uh, 66 studies, and it includes around 17,000 people with dementia and some family caregivers, staff, and experts. And dementia participants were mostly females, and they were from long-term cares. And these studies were mostly from Western countries. So uh, what we have found is that we identify uh, five types of robot which was being used in dementia care. So uh, the first type of robot is pet companion robot. So um, you, you can see here it constitutes actually 62% uh, of the studies uh, we found in our review, which uh, meaning that it has been mostly been used in dementia care, this type of robot. So it is basically it's used to reduce social isolations. So uh, it will interact with the users by making noises and movements. And the second type of robot is humano robot. Uh, the function is very, very similar to pet companion robot that I just mentioned, 
but the only differences is their appearance. So uh, they have a human face and they will, um, when they interact with the user, they will uh, uh, say like human speech rather than solely making animal noises to interact with the user. And the third category is multifunctional robots, uh, which provide uh, multiple service to users, which includes uh, therapeutic activities, navigation, safety monitorings, etc. And the fourth category of robot that we identified is telepresence communication robots. So uh, basically, uh, you imagine these robots work like a Skype or Zoom, but um, it is teleoperated by an operator who are living a pub. Um, uh, living a park, and if you uh, look at the pictures here clearly, uh, you can see a screen on the robots, and that screen actually allows interactive checks between uh, people with dementia and operators who are living miles away from the care's homes. And lastly, it is home care assistive robots, uh, which is used to mainly support home care activities like um, medication adherence, uh, safeties, and uh, in terms of feasibility and acceptabilities, we, our systematic review found that people with dementia, carers, and the other stakeholders really like and enjoy using these robots. However, there are some limitations which affect its ease of use. For example, the speech recognition issues of human and robots, uh, internet connection problems of telepresence communication robots, uh, Pero, uh, the pet companion robots being too heavy to put on the lap of the uh, uh, people with dementia. And uh, in terms of effectiveness, unfortunately, we did not find any evidence of benefits on outcomes uh, which include cognition, quality of life, and neuropsychiatric symptoms. So uh, currently, uh, we cannot recommend the use of robots in uh, long-term care. But what I really want to highlight here today is that uh, in our review, we actually found that um, there are very limited high-quality studies working in these topics. So uh, it may be there may be a good quality evidence of effectiveness in the future. Yeah. And just as a final comment to this, we probably should mention that we should continue research into psychosocial interventions and care work done by people, for people. And I was very lucky to do my project um, in care home settings, looking at intergenerational programs. So hopefully next year, when I have my results, I can present those. Um, so this is a psychosocial type of program and intervention that can hopefully um, help. And of course, we can continue further exploring robot use and um, see how they can complement what we do. Uh, and perhaps good quality studies is something that we can strive for both in uh, studies of robots and people. Thank you very much. So I've been part of several uh, research projects while I was in this network, uh, one of which I worked on last year, which was about supporting ancillary workers in care homes uh, during the COVID-19 pandemic. And ancillary workers uh, really here are cleaners, cooks, people working in laundry, kind of the behind the scene work that is often not mentioned or, or is often overlooked. Um, and this workforce really to put them, first of all, in a sort of limelight, but also to see how they can be supported. Um, so yeah, like I said, ancillary staff are really crucial, like beyond the pandemic, they're crucial to infection control in care homes, they're crucial to provide meals for residents, really to keep the day-to-day -day life in a care home running. Um, but um, yeah, the, the overlap and interface with care work that they often have is, is often overlooked, as well as the relationships they have with residents, as well as with care workers. Um, and COVID-19 kind of brought this work a bit more to the fore. Um, so things about, you know, having lots of responsibilities, but kind of low status, what is skilled work, what is unskilled work, those kind of debates came, came to the fore more during COVID pandemic. And it went from, you know, clapping for carers to clapping for all heroes. And we were kind of wondering if uh, ancillary workers felt this way, if they 
felt included in this, if they uh, felt supported or not. So the main aim of this uh, research was to identify and develop a, uh, a co-produced best practice guide for supporting this workforce um, and to take this beyond the pandemic as well, because just because it came up during the pandemic doesn't mean that after that they don't need support anymore. So what we did was uh, we conducted interviews with mostly at Siri workers themselves, so with cleaners, cooks, people working in laundry, people identifying as housekeepers. Uh, we also talked to some residents, to some care workers and to care home managers and uh, human resource managers just to see what's already out there in terms of support and what's still missing. And so what we created was a good practice guide with at the center really creating a value place for ancillary staff in care homes. And we distilled six different um, principles that are outlined here. I can't go into all of them at this time, but uh, obviously I'm very happy to take questions afterwards. And uh, I also share a link with the full good practice guide later. Um, and what we did was really sort of um, give a give a bit of a context with interview uh, snippets from each uh, for each principle so for example in the fair word and recognition there was a cleaner who said uh, there's always a, a employee of the month but it never goes to a cleaner it only goes to care workers so that's something to just consider when you are working in a care home maybe do we value these people enough and if not how can we improve that um, then there's clear communication through leadership, uh, effective support systems, person-centered staff development opportunities. So, for example, we had cleaners that said, actually, uh, I love providing meals for care for care home residents, and I have received training for that, but I'm not really recognized for it. So it's all those kind of little things that you can just reflect more on in uh, the whole of the care home. Then there's equal and respectful treatment and recognizing relationship with residents and relatives. So, for example, one of the interviews we did with a care home resident said, was that uh, they said they really enjoyed one particular cleaner and they always came and have a chat with them. And then all of a sudden this cleaner disappeared and they never knew what happened to this cleaner. So it's really those kind of relationships that are not seen, uh, but can be very valuable. And we wanted to just shed a light on that with this. Um, so here's the link that you can sort of copy paste if you if you want to if you go to the outputs that's where the whole uh, guide is and our next step is really to uh, see if this guide is uh, is enough if it's helpful um, so we really would like to do an implementation study and see if it works uh, for the ancillary workforce as well as for care home managers and policymakers um, and I have to always give the uh, standard after the picture is taken, the standard uh, disclaimer, we are, of course are really help, grateful for all the help that we got from participants. Uh, and I have to just uh, state that this is not the, um, the views of the National Institute of Health and Social Care, uh, sorry, Health and Care Research, um, but it's that of the authors. That's all. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so thank you. I think I'm doing the last talk. So I'm uh, Andrew Summerlad. I'm a psychiatrist and a researcher at UCL. And um, here talking on behalf of my colleague, uh, Hannah Chapman, and the broader study team based here in the UK and, and Canada and, and the US. Um, so our study is about social connection in people living in care homes. And by that, we mean um, uh, all these sorts of interactions and relationships that, that individuals have, how people connect with one another. And clearly, it's a really basic and essential human need for everybody um, and and that's all the more so for people who are living in care homes who as we've heard today are generally elderly people with complex health needs um, who've moved away from their previous environments or in in group settings um, and it's it's really important because it's linked to better better health outcomes so uh, lower mortality um, but perhaps lower rates of cognitive decline and generally it's a, it's, it's a really good and important thing. Um, and it should be a priority for care homes as well because um, providing good social connection to, to residents is, a, is clearly a marker of good quality care that's happening within the care homes. So we ultimately want to try and uh, develop and test ways of improving social connection for care home residents. Um, but in order to do so, we need to have good ways of being able to assess this. And we find that there aren't any uh, consistent and accurate ways of measuring social connection. Um, so, uh, so our study, which is the SONNET study, is designed to try and uh, to develop new measures of social connection. Um, so we're doing this through these 
kind of linked studies and we're in the process of this at the moment. First of all, we're doing a systematic review uh, like the one we heard of earlier where, where we're looking at all the previous studies that have assessed social connection and then taking a really close look at these to see what, they're, what they have assessed and how good quality they are, how accurate um, uh, they are actually measuring something that, that relates to social connection. And then our aim is to pick out the things that are good about those measures and perhaps use those into a scale or a questionnaire that we ourselves develop. To help with that process, we're, we're, we're uh, doing qualitative, a qualitative study um, with, uh, with, with care home residents, with family members, with care home staff and with clinicians to find out what is most important about social connection when you live in a care home. So that we're then able to take the things that people have told us and build those into our new measure. So we're towards the end of doing interviews and that stage of the study. And we're going on soon to, to, to write our new measure, to, to take all of that information and build our new measure. And then we will probably during the early part of next year be, be ready with a, with a new scale, which we hope will better test uh, social connection, which will go into care homes um, in the UK and in Canada. We'll need to test on test the measure on around 200 people um, uh, to, to, to assess how, how accurate it is and how reliable it is. Along the way, we're finding out some really interesting things. So we've done some initial analysis um, of the 30 or so interviews that we've done um, to see what aspects of social acti or activities within care homes can help uh, to foster social connection and relationships between residents. And just to share some of those findings, um, we found that staff and residents told us that activities which are personalized, so that address the health needs of different residents, but also link um, residents back to, to things that were important to them in the past is, is considered really beneficial. And that's something that we saw works really well here at Hammerson. Um, activities that built a sense of community around the home and also restored some sort of sense of normality, for example, having a, a, a cafe or a, a, a sort of social setting that feels more natural can be really beneficial. Um, we also found positive feedback for activities in which residents were matched because they might have interests in common and that helped to build those relationships together. And finally, um, uh, where residents were able to take initiative to develop the activities that they wanted to take part in and ones which enabled them to support each other and, and might involve teamwork were, were particularly you know, well considered. Uh, so uh, at the end of this study, we hope that we'll have a, a more accurate way of being able to measure social connection, this really important area, so that future research in this area can be conducted with better quality. Um, our contact details are here, including the, the, the website of the study and a link to contact us. And, and I'm happy to take questions now, along with the whole panel, um, uh, uh, about, about all the work that we've talked about today. Thank you. Um, yeah, it's Pori Garrett from the Jewish Deaf Association. Um, for me, I just wanted to ask about social connection. We used to use, and some homes still use, dementia care mapping uh, as, a, as a way of observing and, and interact, uh, interactions, engagement, and well being. And I wondered, is that still considered to be a useful tool? And also the other thing, just from observations for our deaf awareness uh, training, our projects, we do a lot of observations in homes and I think mealtimes are often a missed opportunity uh, for social engagement and I think it, there should be a lot more emphasis on the potential uh, in, you mentioned about matching residents and so on just wondered if you had any comments on those Great. Um, I'm not sure if this yes it is working um, so yeah dementia care mapping is one of the tools that we've identified we found that there are about 50 different ways that previous studies have looked at this I don't have the answer yet as to what you know the quality of that as a tool but it's certainly something that, that um, you know that, that's been used and, and thought of as, as beneficial and I agree completely that there are lots of opportunities within care homes um, where it sounds, it sounds I'm going to stand here instead um, where the where the quality of the um, 
where the opportunity for social connection is potentially missed so that you know mealtimes residents here and elsewhere have told us that mealtimes are a really important opportunity for them to be able to connect with other other people and even during you know during personal care we heard earlier on that that is a you know uh, explaining uh, what's being done is is really important to you know, to reduce the distress that that might cause but also um, it's a chance for for that kind of connection to happen and I think certainly there's there's previous research suggests that that opportunity is often missed um, but uh, but yeah those you know it, it, it isn't just around kind of structured group activities it's um, you know the day-to-day -day, uh, interactions Hi, uh, my name is Stephen. I'm a community outreach worker, South London, Southern Counties. Be interested to know your thoughts on the current technology that's being used in the community. Um, for example, for people with dementia, I'm thinking in terms of a recent app that's come over from Israel. I think it's called Note App, where it's a very simple arrangement. Um, and also even the use of Alexa, in care homes as well where they could be programmed to remind people of meal times or activities you know rather like um we get in a, a i don't know like in some other institution where there are announcements being made things like that are you looking at the existing technology that's available as well or only looking for new types Uh, so uh, uh, I am a researcher who is interested in looking at uh, technology use in dementia care in overall. And um, I think uh, technology in uh, long term has a really huge potential to the community as well as to the long term care homes. Because uh, when technology is used, it uh, you can like do a lot of like uh, very convenient care. You don't need to use a lot of stuff in managing care. But at the same time, um, I think uh, we need to be really cautious about uh, what is the limitations of technology as well, and how care homes or the community or like healthcare professionals should uh, how to uh, make sure how to facilitate the use of technology. Uh, for example, like um, the robots uh, that I just mentioned, like. Uh, for example, like the telepresence communication robot, sometimes technology may involve uh, issues related to privacy. As uh, if you imagine if uh, the robot or technology is being used in a care home, um, actually when you use the telepresence communication robot, uh, the, the living environment of the other residents will also appear on the screen. So I think um, one of the things that we really have to think about is uh, what is the advantage, pros and cons of using technology in community. But I think definitely technology is a very uh, good area to work on. Uh, yes. Yeah. I might just add, reflecting on my experience as a volunteer in a care home, and um, it brings me back to this idea that a relationship between a, a residency, a person living with dementia and technology will always be actually not a dyad, but a triad. So the resident, the piece of technology and the person facilitating access to that. So for example, I remember someone who was really keen to listen to lectures on various different topics that they have always enjoyed in their lives, but the practicality was working out when the one-to-one -one of that person is finishing their work and say a volunteer is not around to put that uh, piece of tech on for, for that resident to then listen and then to monitor if it's still going okay and to make sure that it's audible enough so these are the things that come to mind when we think about well when i think about technology in dementia care and generally care people there's always somebody who will need to help i think um i'm annie stevenson i'm just a question for andrew I'm on social connection i'm just wondering about the barriers um that you found to social connection and in care homes and sort of wondering why it's so difficult <laughs> what happens to staff when they kind of 
somehow lose some of their humanity and I, I think it's not just in care homes but in hospitals and in other institutions and what are your thoughts around the barriers and what happens to why, why do people lose their humanity sometimes not everyone it's a, I mean, it's a, yeah, it's, a, it's an interesting question and it's a difficult one, difficult one to answer. I mean, I think clearly there are these kind of structural issues, uh, you know, around time and um, there is probably a pr prioritization of kind of measurable things, you know, um, people will, um, yeah, uh, personal care, for example, you know, clearly that's something that does have to be done um, and that can be considered you know a, a really core part of someone's job but i think you know i've heard from from uh, care home staff that it then might be considered that that you know doing something social with a resident that that might not be viewed as being such hard work you know that it might be that um you know that it's and so it isn't valued as much and i think that's certainly one of the possibilities that actually yeah you know this isn't considered you know a core part of the role um uh, and something that that maybe that should be built into to systems, you know, that, that there's the um, that this is you know viewed as a priority. I don't know if it's helpful, but I, one of the seminal pieces of research that I remember way back when I worked in a hospital um, as a social worker many years ago was the Isabel Menzies Leith study around defence mechanisms, um, and it's a psych psychoanalytic look at, at what happens to people when they end up in institutions and care workers and nurses and just it just was transformative i just remember it from years back so i don't know whether you've come across it but it's an old piece of research now but very re very relevant i think to the barrier to social connection um, andrew from uh, the jewish death association um i actually have a question for um Sano and Steve about the oral history so I think um, all health. Um, we're working with uh, a lot of care homes around uh, ear health, and we're coming up against a lot of barriers. It's very difficult to get audiology involved with care homes. And I noticed with interest, you have NG48, there's actual guidance from NICE to say that um, dentists must be involved with care homes. And what, what kind of um, support have you had from dentists and all hygienists with your project? So far, uh, we, we are working with the community dental services that are helping us record the various assessments at different stages. And uh, they, are, they are quite keen on working with care homes. Obviously, not every care home is involved at, in, 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 in such sort of, you know, like uh, structure, but we are trying to involve more and more. I mean, it's, it's not my place to say, but obviously community dental services are trying quite hard. Can I just add, uh, the community dental service uh, I work with, they, we, their job on our study is only to collect epidemiological data, like they do just assessment, so they, they're not, in fact, they cannot provide any treatment, even if they want to, because it has to be like a designated person arranged someone to come. So, if, so we do have a dentist on our team, but they're not like authorized to do any treatments or anything. microphone so I've got two questions actually one for Olivia about you know your study is very interesting because you you talked with people that have been almost forgotten during the pandemic from your perspective from the study you have done what do you think can be done more from care providers in terms of improving the quality of, of work for these team members, so for people in housekeeping, for people in the in the kitchen, and so on. The second question I've got is is for Sana and Saif about oral care. Currently, care home residents are discriminated in comparison with the general population in terms of access to oral care. The residents only have access to oral care if it's an emergency through one one one. Otherwise, GP practices don't accept new uh, sorry dental practices don't accept new patients and don't, they don't want to come and see uh, patients in the care homes so from your study from the outcomes of the study what do you feel may be the recommendations that will come out of it thank you 
Shall I go first? <laughs> so um, I would say look at the good practice guide, Nuno. <laughs> no, I mean, there's lots of things I think you can do. One of the things that I already mentioned is just basically recognition. So uh, that sounds very broad and whatever, but you know, it's little things as just realizing that they're there. So there were, for example, um, <clears throat> some family members of, of residents that said, well, I know there's a great cleaner, but I don't know who they are. So my, my loved one keeps talking about this lovely cleaner, but I don't know where they are and I don't know how to thank them. So if you have, for example, introductions of different ancillary workers, so that also family members or, or friends know who to go to, um, kind of in line with that, many of the cleaners and cooks, they have little snippets of knowledge about residents that even care workers often don't have because they have these sort of, you know, in the hallway kind of conversations because they see them almost every day so also incorporating um ancillary workers perhaps in care planning or you know so it's it's that kind of recognition as well in the sort of broader term that can be really useful for for both the care worker as the resident as the ancillary worker um like i said it's slightly more detailed in the good practice guide that we have uh but there's much more work to be done i think on how to best implement such knowledge in care practice and it's also of course it differs per care home if you have a really large care home uh, you probably have much more sort of in between people uh, that will be able to um, recognize these people better than if it's this one you know person on the top so um, that's a bit of a broad answer i'm sorry <laughs> but i think it's very much about reflecting on it and trying to realize where they are and what they're doing and then working with that that's helpful. Yeah, coming to Nuno's question, I, th I think uh, you're right, like there's a lot of issues around access to dental care in the care homes. So with our study that we are doing, there is this oral health assessment tool that is designed. So that, that can actually be completed by the care home staff themselves. They don't need a dentist for that. And based on that tool, I think a dentist can take referrals which would be a little bit more straightforward and sort of more integration between the primary care and the social care. And I don't know if you would like to. Yeah, um, just like to add, um, I mean, as much as it hurts to say, it's true that NHS dent registry was broken, has been broken for years now, and COVID has just worsened it even more. So it's not just care homes, even the general public, they are finding it hard and has been finding it hard to, it's just, unfortunate but it is what it is something beyond our control and it's more for the you know policy makers to look at and how we can improve the access and it's there are a lot of like stark inequalities as well again it, if someone can afford private care arrange a private dentist they are good they are fine but the majority of people it's difficult to get on with NHS entries but yeah the assessment tool we have it um so obviously um the one of your care nightingale is our the intervention uh, group so the staff there we have trained them to do oral health assessment so the assessment what it does is it helps you understand whether they need a professional actual dentist to come in or that's something they can resolve so that's a very quick guide a handy guide sometimes you just don't need you think that there is a dental problem but if you do that assessment it takes like five minutes and you'd be able to understand whether or not they need dental care Okay, sorry, one last question, which is for the dental one. But first of all, can I make a statement that I don't think there's evidence that care home workers lose their humanity. And my, uh, um, generally, when I've observed care home workers, they're excellent. It's not 100%, but generally they're excellent. And I just wanted to defend them. Yeah, um, however, that wasn't what I was going to, that's not what I came to ask. You may not know the answer to this, but why are people with severe dementia excluded from the dental study? This uh, assessments that we are doing is based on questionnaire. So one of the things that came in the ethics application was that we were not allowed to include the people that were not able to consent by themselves. So that's okay, why so it's we, moderate dementia is excluded as well. Uh, so, so as part of this study, it is excluded, yeah. but obviously this is a feasibility trial. And obviously there's a hopefully another study which will be a bigger trial and hopefully we could be more inclusive in that one. Okay, thank you. Yeah.
Yeah, I just wanted to add, that's the whole point we are doing this visibility study and the learnings from it will, will help. We might, you know, come up with, we can go to uh, back to NIHR and tell them, okay, that, and what we are seeing now, like a large part of this population is having dementia. So we are kind of making the problem worse for them by not including them in the study. So hopefully the learnings from this uh, feasibility study will help us inform the future trial. Absolutely. I mean, I know your inc the inclusion criteria are not yours, but it does seem to be taking the people with the problem and, and excluding them from this yeah, possible Yeah, definitely. We are, we are fully aware of that. Yeah, it's yeah. just the ethical issues because we are doing an intervention. There's not a problem about an ethical issue. It, you, they may not be in your study, but there are, the mental capacity act is really, really clear at exactly how you can include people without capacity to give consent. Um, so there's, that can be done. Once they're excluded, and I know you didn't make the exclusion criteria, they're excluded um, according to the protocol, but it's it's something that is absolutely set out as to how you can do it. And in particular, it says that people who do not have the capacity to consent should not be excluded from studies. Also, uh, one of the things that was not mentioned here due to time constraints was that we are also doing a process evaluation simultaneously which means that whatever barriers and whatever issues are raised based on the interviews with the care home staff, the managers, we are sort of including it as a learning from that study. So uh, obviously this issue of dementia and excluding them and also issue re regarding the native English speaking people being one of the inclusive inclusion criteria has came up. So we'll be sort of considering that when we design the main study. Thank you.